when you get to the top end players in the NHL, the ice is soft, the ice is chippy, the ice is ruddy, the ice is shitty. Right? This is this is what you get from these players. But it's a subjective thing. And I, I tell people, I say, watch them play. Watch the play of the game. Well, the puck's jumping all over the place. The puck jumps all over the place anyways because it's rubber and you're hammering at it. Every now and then they do have a bad sheet of ice. The uh, second from the, you know, the first game of the NHL series in Nashville, the plant got away on them and they didn't know it at the warm up. And the plant pulled down the surface temperature to 16 degrees. So when they went out for the warm up, it just rutted. And with high definition TV, I sat there and went, oh my God. You could see the ruts. Because they come in, they drop a bunch of pucks out, throw them out, and then everybody attacks the nets. They come in, do the loop, out, shoot, out. And the ruts were amazing. And I went, someone's in big trouble. <laughs> Need to say, he no longer works in the NHL. <laughs> But stuff happens. You get caught with your pants down. Air ice interface temperature is always a good thing to keep an eye on. And this is the this is the original one from Maple Leaf Gardens. About it's the new Leaf Garden. Here's the line. Take a look. This is where they are on the peaks. Don't ask me why they're down here at 1820. But this is a flood. You can see the flood go onto the log. Another flood. Another flood. Um, Pre-flood, pre pre-game, flood at the end of the first, flood at the second, end of the third. Well, their average temperature is somewhere in that 25, 26 area that they're playing on. If you bring your sheets too cold, they don't stand up. That was the one with Madison Square Gardens, but it's all about heat. Heat's coming into your building, whether you like it or not. Sensible heat. Engineers hate when you say this, it's the heat you sense. Conduction, convection, radiant. Solar radiation, convection by warm air as it hot air rises. Cold air pulls into the bottom. Sensible heat, you get it from the sun. It affects your building, it comes through your blocks. They built two rinks, Chestwood and Westwood arenas, and they for both, Simcoe did the mechanical on it, the same buildings, and one ran 1820 and one ran 1618 for brine feed return temperatures. And they didn't figure it out for a long period of time. It was a row of trees outside of the building that blocked the roof from the sun. If I see a, anybody who doesn't know what LED lights are, I'll kill them. Everybody, you gotta go to LED lighting. It's one of the biggest saviors around. And they are now on sixth generation. And they're up to 6,500 kilowatts. And the new ones are 8,500 kilowatts. The amount of power that you pull into these lights, it changes the amount of light you get from a warm glow to a pop white blue. And it's, it's almost blinding. I, just, I was down at the, consumer, uh, the show last week in Chicago, or shit, this week. And Eaton is a light like this for buildings like this. They set them up and you can actually, you get like a board to change the lighting. You can force the lighting into the stands. You can force the lighting directly on the surface. You can go in and shape, put it into a basketball court and it's all LED. And they're white, white, white. And everybody says, oh, uh, they're, they're light. They, they, they give off, they don't give off as much heat. LEDs give off a lot of heat. Not as much as old. Anybody got metal halides anymore? Everybody out of metal halides? Good thing. Wait 20 minutes for them to turn on. This is the new, uh, this is in uh, Moncton, Moncton fourplex. And latent heat. Latent heat, all latent heat is an increase in moisture in your building, increase in water vapor. They're the two types of heat. Add more, add water, you add heat. Take away water, remove heat. <clears throat> this is a twin pad of ice. They started painting it. Well, 
they dried out their building, they had the dehumidifier running, everything was fine. They came in, painted it. They broke for lunch. And the other arena didn't have, which wasn't in ice mode, had a, sh had a show, a horticultural show show up. They opened up the back door, started and loaded in all their stuff, started to rain, and the guys came back. And you can see that it started dripping a little bit. And then it got out of, they, it's, it's a barometric pressure change. That's what you've done. You've taken that moisture out of the building, and now that outside air wants to get inside and equalize out. And so all that moisture came into the building, and they were done. Well, they just didn't have enough buckets. <laughs> and this, this picture I stole from Art Sutherland, who's one of the better engineers around. That's latent load. It's, it's water vapor. It's, it's a mass. And it is heat in your building, and your plant has to absorb it. And it'll eventually settle out on your floor and create frost. It's like, a, it's like a, a glass full of ice on a hot day, and the moisture all collects outside on the glass. Where'd the moisture come from? From the air. It's condensing. This is, a de this is in Japan. The guy's name's Hiroshi Kobayashi. It's a curling club. And uh, he put in desiccant dehumidification. And within about 40 minutes, he can dry the whole building out. Now, mind, it's only two sheets of curling ice. But you know the havoc frost can play with curlers. You can't get the rock down to the other end. You got to throw them overhand. And, that, and that's what it is. This is what this is all about. You, you let humidity come into your building. The Oshawa generals uh, years ago asked me tonight, they said, Can you, we want you to come in and write a report for us. I said, the first, when someone wants you to write a report for them, the first question is, what do you want me to say in the report? Because they, have, they want a report for something. And theirs was, they wanted dehumidification, they wanted two new Zambonis. So I wrote this three-page report, age of the Zamboni, service cost, da, 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 da. and I said, you also have to have dehumidification. So they put a dollar on every ticket and hoped to pay for this $180,000 dehumidifier in, in about a year and a half. Well, in a year and a half, the money went into General Ledger, and the Oshawa General spent all the money, and they found black mold in the building. The health department came in and shut the Oshawa Generals down. You're not playing in your building anymore. They lost all the revenue from their team. They had to go to a small building. They had the guys come in with the white suits, the mask, wipe off every nut, every bolt in the building, every seat. Started the plant back up and the black mold came back. They hadn't gotten rid of it. And the building is closed and now the Yashua General's plant, the old new building. All for $160,000. They knew what the problem was. They didn't fix it. Now this is a little bit of an odd one. You can't see it from where you're sitting. This is Blues Phoenix. This is the, the original coal center that opened up in the Keel Center, sorry. St. Louis. Yeah, St. Louis. The guy's name was Bob Johnson. And he would write this out every NHL game. Relative humidity, dew point, temperature. Air supply temperature, auxiliary one, air handling unit two, three, four, five. This is a fair, fair sized building. But he would do this diligently. And uh, their ice went, for, went south and they phoned me up and said, can you come and take a look at our ice sheet? I said, sure. I know them down there fairly well. I said, where's Bob? Oh, Bob left. I said, well, let's go back and find some of his records. You guys used to have the best ice in the NHL. I only said that to puff them up a little bit. but And uh, they, found a way, they found a way to start bringing their... Someone said, the ice isn't hard, the ice is soft. So what they were doing is, slowly but surely bringing the floor temperature down, floor temperature down, the ice is soft. The ice wasn't soft, it had become brittle. Once you get below that 18, 17 degrees, the ice becomes brittle, and it starts to rip and tear. You can take a look at the outside edge of a skate mark on a half, on a curve, 
and you'll see it shaling off in like small pieces the size of dimes. But here these guys are. They've got their floor temperature, and I said, what's your brine temperature? He says, oh, we're down around 12. I said, what? I said, go find Bob Johnson's old records. They had them, they found them, and they sent this one off to me. Ice temperature, not Celsius, obviously. Surface temperature. Nobody runs a surface temperature like that. 26, 27 degrees. The magic number on this whole chart that no one really looks at is this one over here. Dew point. 30, 34, 32, 30. There is no latent load. There is no moisture that's coming down on your sheet. So when you take that factor out of it, be it 40%, 50% at whatever temperature, you can run higher temperatures. I digress. I think this is an NHL number, isn't it? And that dew point's about 38, 39, that dew point's about 38, 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And in just a little bit of an offshoot, this is something that you should take a look at. Always be aware of the air handling on your building. And whether you're a big building or a small building, know where your air is going. That, uh, that cheap bugger I was telling you about that only bought four boxes of paint off me in Clinton, Ontario, home of the Black Donnellys. Uh, he had a thing that he did in his building. When he went to paint his building, your big trick about making, get, having a great paint job is cold and dry. Cold and dry. Cold floor in your building dry. You don't want any humidity. And you don't want humidity coming into your building or penetrating your building. So when I found out he was using four boxes, I went down to see how he got such a great paint job. I think it was maybe three boxes of paint. Four anyways. I go down to the building <clears throat> and I arrive and he's got, he's duct taped all the doors shut. <laughs> he's got one door at the very back of the building with a key in it and he's duct taped the inside of it. <laughs> and the big fan at the back of the arena, the, his exhaust fan, he's got that all taped off and plasticed off and he's using his arena floor that he's got set down around 16, 17 degrees, he's using that for a condenser. So any moisture that's in the building locked in is being attracted to the floor and forming frost, thin layers of frost. And every three or four hours you go out there and burn the frost off, burn the frost off, burn the frost off. And that was taking the moisture out of the air and the floor was getting colder. But it was all to the aspect of air handling too. You don't want air, you don't want to be able to have air coming into your building at any given time unless it's treated. Air in the ice phase. This is a peculiar phenomenon. We've talked about it for over 40 years. It was brought to our attention by Gil Adamson. He was a research chemist for Roman Haas. And this is where a lot of the confusion starts with air in the ice phase. That's an ice cube. Made it in my fridge. Yeah, my freezer. I keep my fridge cold. It's for the beer. Beer for the beers. Uh, what, what, what do you see there? Really, when you think about it, where do, look at the air bubbles in it. Where did it, like, when I put it in the ice cube tray, I fill it with water, looked at it, I got water in the tray. I froze it. Where'd all the air bubbles come from? Don't tell me they're micro bubbles. <laughs> I must have left the cap off. Maybe. When you start making ice in an ice cube tray, a rather peculiar phenomenon happens it starts to freeze from the outside. That's the first shell of ice that starts to form. Water is the only thing that's gonna freeze, not the air. But because there was no air in there, there was water. Two things were in that water. Dissolved air, 
and mineral content. And neither one of those things freeze. But when I'm making this ice cube, it's freezing, and it's freezing, and it's freezing, and the last piece to freeze is that centerpiece. Dissolved air is, is it's a molecular, it's in water, it's what fish breathe. It's not going to freeze. It becomes entrained because it's now locked in, it becomes entrained in the center, and at the very last moment before it starts to freeze, you'll get these little bubbles that it's dissolved air and water that come out of solution. And that's why we heat water for Zambonis and Olympias too. <laughs> and this cloudiness that you see here, this is the dissolved air coming out of solution, but you can see the cloudiness that's the calcium, magnesium, iron in water. And the first to part to freeze is this bottom piece here. See how nice and clean it is? That's the water frozen. This is the mineral content and the dissolved air in water. And that's what gives you a soft, punky piece of ice. And this is my test sheet that we run in Toronto. Well, Newmarket. And when they asked to put a five gallon bucket of water in the test sheet, because I was in a hurry, I wanted to test some paint out. They took the bucket, dumped the bucket in, this is all copper with uh, Freon in it, half inch copper. It's on a four by three test sheet that we do for testing paint. And this is what froze. And this is air, in dissolved air in water trying to come out of solution. Now, you, you might think the gap at the front of the class is trying to pull your leg, but I'm not. You can go and look at this. So this is oxygen in water, and these are the temperatures. Now this is oxygen. Don't forget there's other things in water. Nitrogen, helium, any other gas that's available that you breathe. Nitrogen as well, carbon dioxide. But you can see there's 14 milligrams per liter at zero degrees. Most of your water somewhere in here. As you heat the water to fill your Zamboni, which is somewhere about here, 160 degrees. You've removed most of the oxygen. And that's what gives you that clean sheet of ice. Now, air is a different principle. Because that's the complete. So if you have water that's in this here 50 degree range, you might have 23 milliliters of air per liter as you heat the water. And you can see this on a pot of water on a stove. Put a pot of water on a stove, heat it up slowly, and at about 140 degrees, it'll all go white and frothy, and then it'll go clear. And that's the dissolved air coming out of solution. And it comes out, comes to the surface of the top of the water, and then it all dissipates. If you take that same pot, let it cool down, and put it back on the stove, it won't happen again because there's no more air in it you have removed the dissolved air from the water. Dave, so when, but when your ice is sitting there, or your water is sitting there, yep. is it absorbing air? No, it's not absorbing air. People think that. It's not. It's in training air. There's a, the surface of water has an electrical charge, as silly as it sounds. There's three or four really good books written on it. Um, and that's where we talk about the starvation flooding when you want to build a great sheet of ice. It is a peculiar phenomenon. If you want to build a great sheet of ice, build it in thin layers. Has anybody ever noticed that when you go to a nice cold sheet of water, cold sheet of ice, and you put a spray of water on, and you pull the hose back quickly, that you can see the ice go, do, 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 do. it gets a shimmer to it? Nobody noticed that? Like it almost looks like it's dancing? That's the dissolved air coming out of solution. When they make ice cubes, hmm. Ooh. So 
It's around, I was, I, I get into too many curious things that drive other people crazy, but when they make ice cubes, they feed, uh, it's in a, a nice machine. There's, they, they have these tines, they're all <clears throat> 10 degrees, and they have a sprayer that sprays water on these tines. And as this thing spins around, it sprays water on the tines, and when the tines become a certain size, they reheat the, the Freon in that pipe, and all the ice cubes fall off. And that's why you've got the ice cubes with the holes in them. That's how they make them. The other way that they make ice cubes, and it's the Canadian Ice Machine Company. This goes back as early as, I think, the 1957. And when we were down at the plant, they still had a couple of them left. We're gonna run out of paper here. <clears throat> They would fill buckets up with water that were wrapped in a, with ammonia pipe. They would fill them with water and then they would start cooling it. As it cooled, it would freeze the core on the inside. The core on the inside wouldn't freeze, it would be the last to freeze. So they'd have these large and it was a time thing they had two and a half hours on the timer and when it got to a stage where all the impurities in the water and all of the dissolved air they would drill it out shut off the thing and then they would take these big chunks of ice and grind them up and they would buy a bag of ice that was all in big chunks and the reason they did that was to get rid of the dissolved air out of the ice and to get the mineral content of the ice and give you a great sheet of ice and the last piece of proof in the pudding is when they used to go out and, I'm not that old, but when your grandmother had an ice box, they put the ice in the top of the fridge and the cold air would drop and your milk would stay good. But they got that ice from a lake. Well, when they got lake ice, what happens? It starts freezing at the top and all the stuff in water would sink to the bottom, the mineral content, and they'd go out and saw it out of a lake. And those blocks of ice were the size of this table and were absolutely pure and clean because they removed them with heat and the air would come out of solutions, the air wouldn't freeze. They would be a solid block of ice. And that's what we're trying to do here. When you want to build up ice, put it on in thin layers. You can only freeze so much water and so it was referred to as starvation flooding. You want a clean sheet of ice? Put it on in thin layers. So I got a question. Mm -hmm. So if we built it up with hose floods, um, we noticed that the scum would rise, seem to rise. Yeah, because it's not going to freeze. Yeah. It's the last to freeze. Yeah. It's freezing. It's pulling it up. Yeah. So we some of it, some of it would freeze, but a lot of it would come up each time. Okay, and then when we're done, we can. Shave it off. Scrape it off. Okay. Go out there, take a really good cut and everything. Yeah. Curling clubs do that. That had lousy water. All right? Go out and scrape the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. Scrape it. Get the garbage off the top. So now when we build slow by spraying, we seem to be trapping. You lock a lot of it in. in there. Yep. But how much do you have? How dirty is your water really? Okay. It's not, sometimes it's not that bad. No, that's good. Depending on where you get your water from. Good quality water should have very little mineral content. And the last but not least, I think that this is my part anyways. Any part-timers here? Oh good, we can make fun of them. <laughs> Didn't put it up fast enough. <laughs> hey, we all started somewhere, didn't we? We all started somewhere. I learned at Double Rinks. Chris Sills had a hot date. She was blonde and she had a convertible. And I was the only guy at the rink at eight o'clock. I get to drive the Zamboni. <laughs> He's leaving. Look at these are the keys. Don't touch this. Don't touch this. Don't touch the blade. And when you come off the ice, lift this. That was my first instruction. I'm a horrible driver, I don't drive anymore. 
and, 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 and it, it really is funny because to be a good driver, it takes a lot of time. And some guys are great drivers naturally. Some drivers are great drivers on their machines. Because when you go to get on somebody else's machine, and it's not the same, you go, oh, geez, this is like you're getting into someone else's car. Or you get on an old beater, and the guy's been driving it for, and he's great on it because he knows what everything is. He knows, ah, yeah, I'm out there. Yeah, he knows all the little quirks about it and everything else. You get on it, and you go, oh, my God, I'm going to wobble. He's just, guys, <laughs> but the driver is everything. Sometimes they're good drivers, sometimes they're bad drivers. This guy's one of the better drivers around. It's Danny Ahern out of Chicago, and he eat, sleeps, walk, Samboni. Um, he's a race car driver as well, and he does, um, he was the first guy to do all the hydraulic lines for the grease fittings up behind the seat and underneath so you didn't have to climb down because you're supposed to grease those fittings every night. <laughs> right. They were greased when. But it's the driver. It's the cut, the water, the speed basic ice maintenance that you set aside, and it's training. It's the thought about what he's actually doing. Most people don't take it into account, but it's the cut. How many times have you gone into a rink and you watch the guy go out and mums and tots have been out there and he's out there, the guy pulls out the ice and he just cuts a whole load off and lays a whole other load of water. You can't drag him off the machine and beat him senseless like I want to. But he, all he wants to do is just go out, clean it up a little bit, pick up a little bit of snow, very little blade, blade, and drop about this much off the spreader pipe. Or even in some cases, go out and throw a wash water on because no one's going to notice anyways. But it's the common sense of what, you're, what you have to do. And sure, you might go into a horrible nightmare weekend where you've got to cut the hell out of the ice because you've got a hockey practice and they're the 18, the 18 19 year olds 18 and under, and these kids aren't, they got boots on with their quarter inch hollow cuts, rocker blades, and they come into the corners and just <laughs> That's when I have a tendency to keep it a little bit warmer. <laughs> that way they don't cut as much. And then you've got, there's one of those every 18 hours. And at 12 o'clock at night you're going, geez, am I gonna have enough ice for tomorrow morning? And you're out there doing floods because, really, when you think about it, the machine and the water, what you put down, you can take off a lot more. There is a, there is a law of diminishing your turns with an ice resurfacer that most people don't take into account. A full compaction of Zamboni is 2,800 pounds, and it holds 165 gallons of water, or thereabouts. 10 pounds a gallon, 2,800 pounds of snow, it'll actually cut off more than it will put out. And Zamboni will tell you there's enough water in there to do two floods. 80 gallon flood, 80 gallon flood. Well, maybe not if you've got big cuts and ruts in the ice, but in most cases that's what it'll do. So if you've got a guy that's the part-timer and comes in and he's doing the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and he's got programming 18 hours, he's got 18 cuts, 18 floods, you can run into trouble by Monday morning if he's not doing it right. And he has to understand, too, that that pivot point that he runs into, it's, it's there. He's going to go through it eight times at the end. Eight, nine times? Depends on how good he is. <laughs> right? He's doing that. And he's going through that, that crease area, and he's cutting. I used to cheat. I used to just bump the conditioner, but I don't recommend anybody do that anymore. It's, you might have to pull the blade up. You're dumping hot water in that crease. That, you're heating the interface, and after that third load of water, you want to... This was the Olympics. Torino. Torino. That's, that's Westcott. I Westcott and Moffat. I don't know what the whole story is there. What are you doing out there with a squeegee? The go how, nothing, nothing the goalie hates more than standing in water for the first five minutes of the period. That falls on the driver. You gotta be able to pull it out of the crease, put it down, and I don't care how big the ruts are. If you've got big ruts, you can't freeze them in anyways. You can put water into them, 
but they're not going to freeze in 20 minutes. And it's the driver that makes that call. He goes out, he looks at the ice, he knows what the programming was for the day, and he has to make the decision on what he's going to cut off, what he's going to put down. And good drivers have to know and have to be able to do it. Ice maintenance, some people think that that 10 minute resurface is ice maintenance. Ice maintenance is, when do you do ice maintenance? Every chance you get. Everybody got an edger here? Everybody use it religiously? Once, twice a day, depending on your programming. Clean up around the edges. I've got some horror story pictures. Of, this is all you see of the kick plate. Gosh, you need the, the banked edges so you can keep speed up in the corners, right? Ice thickness, inch and a half ice is a set standard for all of the associations that I know right now. And if you're having something like a tournament, you might want to carry a little bit more, build it up during the week. And I don't have a real problem with people that want to carry two inches of ice if they're going into heavy programming because they're going to lose some ice. It's much easier to cut ice out than it is to try and build it up during a tournament. So you might want to build Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, go to your tournament Friday. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't cost you twice as much. Simcoe's got records on this. If you go from one inch of ice to two inch of ice, your power costs only increase about 9%. That's the problem area. Live and die by the edger. You've got to edge. And in most cases, your edging really is about here to here, and sometimes in front of the player's bench, depending on what sort of bench you've got. You don't always have to, you can always wind it off and just keep going and take a look at the kick plate. You know it's an eight inch kick and you're showing seven inches, you're fine. But when you start seeing that kick start to creep up and you hold, oh, geez, let's cut it. And if it's really bad, double cut because you're gonna have to get that conditioner down into that trough and you don't want it tipping up on you because you'll start hollowing out on the other side. That's why the is so key because if you really get out of control then that becomes twice as much work. Yeah. Drill and check is the only way I can do it. I, there's been guns out there. Becker had one for a couple of years. They, they said it would you know, do ice thickness with imaging. It didn't work. You'd go and measure a spot and it'd say three quarters of an inch, come back five minutes later, put it again, inch and a half. <laughs> and I'm not here to... Well, no, this, was, this is this one. Here it is right here. Ultra sun, they don't make them anymore, stop making them. But they're still out there. Some people have got them, swear by them. And they're not accurate. But it really boils down to, there are the eight factors, driver, sensible load, ice thickness, water quality. And the one that actually pops into this one that really does, if you can get all of these things pushed into under the quality ice and control them all, you'll get a great sheet of ice. And that's what it's, you got to get all those things in the box and you got to have a great driver. But the one thing that does pop into this that was brought to my attention through Northeastern University, a lot of it sometimes can also just be programming. You get, you get, you get caught with that programming kit. They had two, they had college, Northeastern, and then women's. You got six hours of practice. Like by the time that, by the time hour four came along, the, you know, the second group's already complaining. You got 28 people, 24 people out on the ice just carving the hell out of it. You can't recover, it's ice. And it's steel blades, and these kids aren't kids anymore, like they're 195 pounds of just solid muscle, and they're just chewing the hell out of your ice. And don't take them long. And the worst thing I see on ice sheets when I go into a building is I, uh, cones. Skate around the cone. Okay. Doesn't take long to hit concrete. 
Yeah, it's knowledge of communication. The driver should know. Everybody should know. Driver, operator, programmers, part-time employees, everybody should have a basic idea what ICE is and what it's about. Facility managers, recreation directors, board members, town clerk, the mayor, everybody should be aware of that about what the job is to do. It's, uh, it's not, and the mayor simply because somewhere along the line you're going to have to go to him and say, I need $180,000 for a new Zamboni. What do you mean? You just bought one 25 years ago. I always, I always like to keep them in, informed. Town clerks and uh, councillors are always a good one to work over because I live in Aurora and we've got like five arenas. We have one arena for 4,800 people. And we got lots, and we don't have any hockey in town. We've got, our demographics have changed. We used to be north of Toronto, like we're 50 clicks north, it's a little hole in the wall town. Not anymore. There's 8,000 new houses coming. Russians and Jordanians, and Chinese, and we're a whole new world. They haven't got here yet, but they're coming. They don't play hockey. Now we got all these hockey rinks, and you want to get ice time on Saturday night at 8 o'clock? You go on and rent it. Yeah. LED lights, pink hockey ice. I don't even know what I got on the end of this. I was the last four or five. Pink, light pink, Boston. That's not. That's that's all textile logos. Circles, gold creases. Fast ice. It's a spray system that's been around for about 15 years. Promoted by little Stevie the Dick Dog. Uh, it's been bought by Zamboni. Zamboni now owns this. And what it is is a spray system that's on the back of the machine. This is an older, uh, I got this on an old slide. And what it does is it tells you the thickness of the ice, your surface temperature, your speed, your flow rate, how much time you're out on the ice. But the guys in New York put it on and they've tied it into their computer Start time, spray thickness, duration in minutes, how long they were on the ice, the average speed. They used 149 gallons of water, 92, 144. So they're putting on fairly heavy floods. Like if you go out for 12 minutes, they've almost unloaded the whole machine at 149 gallons. That's full flood and they're chugging with the machine. But this is all information that's useful to the engineering staff. Because they're the guys that are saying, well, how much water are they putting down? Where do we want to be? Do we want to start cold or not? And this now is all tied into the refrigeration package of Pat Coin that has 78 points of reference in his building. All the air handlers, all the relative humidity, all the dew point, all of these things are all just basic stats. And they put it in and they try and find out where they've got the best ice. Hmm. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tells you how much exactly, right? So they can, they've got all, it's just more information. They're making it confusing for me. <laughs> yep, yep. That's the uh, automatically sharpen your skates. Five bucks a skate, comes with the card has your cut on it, you put it in your card, takes your money off the card and sharpens your blade for you. They're so lazy they won't even squeeze you, they vacuum. Really? Curling ice. That's the Joglo they've been using on uh, Plexi in Nashville. Anybody got Plexi here? Apparently it's got lanolin in it and lanolin does a great cleanup job on your uh, on your glass. But those panels are huge now. Four, six by eight, yeah. Advertising. Yes, I need a break from the advertising. That's a multi-spray wand. There's three different heads on it. One for painting, one for sealing, and one for applying water. 
So as you go through the stages, you can either adjust it to the amount of water you want to put out. And so like we painted the white and then we sealed it. We cut back on the water on the seal. This one, you just turn the nozzles. And now you'd want to build ice, so you just turn the nozzles up. Give you 15, 15 gallons a minute, 400 gallons an hour. How fast do you want to do the, um, when you're building ice, how fast do you want your spray to be? Well, you, want to be able to, you want to be able to build ice continually. That's, that's really what you want to do. Because if you look at a chart where your energy use is, it's that 32 to 32 degrees from a liquid to a solid. That's where all your energy is used up, 144 BTUs on the phase change. So you want to freeze water constantly. You don't want to go out there like I used to do and put out a 2,000 gallon flood, melt back a half an inch, a quarter inch of ice that you'd already made, and then have to refreeze it. So you want to continually go out there and build ice. And I, like I said, I usually divide the rink into three sections. And in a case like this where you're not, you're almost at the end of the ice, you don't have a lot of ice, but I would take the hose out down the boards a little bit, go through it, center ice. That way I've only got 85 feet of hose on the ice. One guy can do it and you can just stay out there. Third of the rink, next third, next third. Go back to the start, put more water on. Next third, next third. And if it's not freezing fast enough, just cut back your water. Because you're always building ice, not melting it back. And you're not waiting for it to freeze. That's when you make your best ice. <laughs> this is back. These are different presentations. This is Maritime Atlantic Operators Institute. You guys should get one of these. Anyways, this is the drive-on remote control edger with a laser. <laughs> they took it off YouTube, and it, you just it, it drives around and edges. Yep. I mean, they had them over in Norway last year, and they were trying it out. It actually does work. But I'm just real leery about leaving something on the ice under remote control. You come back in the morning, big ruts in your ice. It was on YouTube. They took it off. I don't know how they pulled it. But it, somebody had left the gate open and had gone off at the gate and down a concrete hallway. <laughs> how big's the clock? They're huge. I think it's, I think it's almost 50 feet. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah. The NHL's got a big problem. All the buildings are in competition to see who has the biggest clock. Sorry. <laughs> this is a rink we did just to prove that we could do it, but we didn't want to. See the white line across the ice? That's 16 foot panels of, of plastic mesh. We did it at uh, Mississauga. They didn't want to paint, and they wanted another way to do it, so we did it for them. Any questions? Yeah, in a minute. You got a minute? Everybody got a minute? I want to run. I'm going to run through a couple more slides. I'm just trying to fix this one up so that you can have a look at it. He was trying to pull a logo out of the ice and stepped in the water, and pulled his face down to the sheet of ice. So he goes to the. He goes to he goes to the hospital, the intern's there, and the guy stitches him up with like eight stitches. He goes to his family doctor and he says, who did this to you? Now he's got this, it looks, he looks like a pirate. That's what, somebody actually in Aurora has this thing. He's a dreamer. He thought we had it last year. And these are the two guys that stole the cup off Boston. Jim Schmookie, Dave Grimes. They're both good guys.
There's the newest one. There's the second one. This is the Rico Coliseum, my favorite customer. I think that green is, they got, they, it's like a cat's eye or something like that, so they have a pail for green. It's one little dot about this big. Sweep them, sweep them, sweep them. Paint, paint, paint. This is actually a painted logo and it does look good. Yep. This is why we started getting into textile logos. This guy complained at Salt Lake City all day. I said, hurry up and get that finished. <laughs> and he was using this wee little brush. I said, you'll be, you'll be there all day, and he was. That was the last painted Olympics. And this is why we tell people, don't use that for a logo. Black, gray, and purple, dark purple. They put it in the ice, and three weeks later, that's what it looked like. Don't do it. We put it right on his quote, and he phoned up and said, you can't see the logo. I said, you got three colors that are so close to each other, it's just a mess. Get the kids out, paint her all up. That's black here, distributed out of uh, Norway. <coughs> Getting pretty fancy with the blue lines. We talk about air entrainment and logos if you don't put them in properly. If you don't force the air side of the force the air out of them first. I I like a roller. And that's one that's one that we did Aurora and you had to stretch it. I think it's just off a little bit, but you you pull it tight, stretch it, and flood it in. Look good. Hey, that's you. Where were you? I heard he's big. In I heard he's tall in Japan. <laughs> oh yeah, we got all the logos out. And then you lay them out on a piece of concrete, wash them off, spray them down, lay them on a piece of concrete, and take a squeegee to them. Flatten them out, let them dry, roll them up, put them away for next year. So they're, you know, people say, oh, they're really expensive. They're not expensive if you get to re get to reuse them every year. <laughs> this is a, I don't know why New York, I, I just talked, I just let Bill left me a message I'm back there on the September 3rd and I put the logos in the wrong spot two years ago. <laughs> Position A1, B1. The guys laid them all out and we we're in a hurry, let's get it done. I'm going back to my hotel and about two in the morning, I sent, him, I sent Bill off a picture and said, here's the job's done, I'm gone. Went back to my hotel room and I get a phone call two in the morning. He phones back and says, the, the logos are in the wrong spot. I went, oh, God. So I go back over to the building. Jack's still there. So we get out the Zams and we cut. They've already built like three-eighths of, uh, not three-eighths, more than that. Almost a half-inch ice over top of the logos. Get the Zamboni out, cut down till you get close to them. <laughs> Took a piece right out of it. I went, oh. And uh, so we had them go back. They dumped the snow at the, 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 on the level. I went back through the snow with a shovel and I found the little piece. Oh, but it didn't fit. It was missing because of the blade. So I, we switched the logos, got them in the right spot, and I put that one down. You can see it there after I've reinstalled it. I, don't, I, I took these pictures, I don't know why, but you can see it there. It's patched up pretty good. I went to their drapes at the back of the building, took the drapes, shaved the bottoms of the drapes off, <laughs> all these little black fibers and stuck them down on the patch. <laughs> you can do what you gotta do.
we're doing black light stuff now. And this is just out in, uh, that's a LED, $8,500. 10 inch square panels, and they all interlock. You can actually see, the problem is, everybody says, oh yeah, they look great. The panels are probably a quarter inch thick, and they're plastic, so you gotta have a good lot of ice over top of them. And you, I wouldn't recommend you stop the Zamboni on top of them. But you can see the power lines right here. See, uh, right there, 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 and there. And they can't, they can't turn them up. That's only a quarter of the brilliance. Because light is heat. This is what you get when you die. I mean, does a memorial on the back of the chair for you. I thought that was pretty neat. Dedicated 33 years of service. <laughs> Zap Ruins guy. We hate him anyways. This is our uh, this is our Zamboni rodeo we do, do down in PEI every year. It's put on by Zamboni. We had to take the alcohol out of it. <laughs> it, was a, it was a time thing. It was a lot of fun. That's Everett Tucker. Where are they doing? Where are they, where are they? We, did a, we put a line on the ice and we put out cones. And the time, he, Everett, Everett's a great Zamboni driver. He drove it, right? And he timed it to what speed you're supposed to be doing to get through the course in a specific time. And the closest to that number, it wasn't about speed, it was about getting there without hitting any of the cones. So you lose you know, three seconds for a cone, touching a cone, moving a cone, right? Missing, going off track. So the red paint stick was the mark that you followed around because the track was sort of, there's a double loop in it and a cross, so you had to follow the line. Conditioner up? Uh, no, conditioner, was, we had to bring the conditioner up. We used to have, we'd paint numbers on it. You had to cut the number up, but they wouldn't let us do it anymore. So, but, uh, yeah, you had, to stop, you had to stop front wheels on the one side of the ring and the rear wheels on the other side. Yeah. Speed skating ice. There's a guy that, that's Mark Messer. He's probably one of the best. He's uh, highly respected. Did you? Yeah. He's too busy. Yeah, he's on a... Should have told him I was coming. He like... Uh, that's why he didn't come. <laughs> he's, a, he's as good as they get, boy. I've done a lot of work with him. <laughs> he said they wanted, they wanted ice in uh, Korea when we were over there, and he wanted an ice machine to make like, snow cones. They bought this thing, and they would take purified water and run it over a stainless steel cylinder with a razor blade on the front edge, and it would make clean snow for him. You want this? Messer, because he's burying lines in the ice, and you don't want to use old snow that's got shit in it. So they bought this $4,800 piece of stuff. Don't ask me to hide stuff. So when it comes to using CO2, though, there's a, like a, an extinguisher. A you got to be careful when you're using extinguishers. There are CO2 extinguishers and there are CO2 powder extinguishers. You don't want the powder extinguishers to poof! Everybody's standing around with white powder all over them. How long, how long can you hold it there though? Not long. CO2 is, is minus 57 degrees. And if you try and patch something up with it, CO2 will float away. If you're trying to patch something up, take a box that's opened on the bottom pour the CO2 into the box slowly, and the CO2 sits in the box at minus 26, 27 degrees, and it freezes that area of ice. Lift the box up, but keep in mind that that area of ice is, depending on how long you've been standing there, squeezing the CO2 into it, that area of ice might be minus 15 degrees now. So you've got to temper it, so I always take out a backpack and wash it down too, and you see how fast it takes up. I don't like using CO2, but Sometimes you have to. <laughs> I won't even bother trying to explain that one.
That was a Semco job. It's the header under the uh, Olympic Oval. And they put the header in, got the header all up, hung it all up. And one morning, Wayne Dilk came in and the entire header was lying on the floor for the Oval with like 30,000 gallons of brine in it. That's the one in Richmond. And so they, they, like, the panic on the Simcoe people and the building people was dramatic. Like, people were almost passing out from the... The whole header had fallen on the floor. Someone had drilled the anchor holes and they put the wrong anchors in. And when they filled it with fluid, the weight of the fluid dropped it all down. So they had to jack up. They brought in like 15 forklifts, jacking it up bit by bit. And the truck came with lumber within about 45 minutes. And they started jacking it up. Outdoor rinks. Norway uh, put one in. This is Dragon, I think. And it's, it's a hit. They put in lights. They sell coffee and alcohol and raising tons of money. And it doesn't, the plant really is only making up the differential in temperature. You know, they just put the ice in and they don't really need a big physical plant to run it because it's already, you know, 28, 27 degrees. And when it goes above 32 degrees, the plant comes on. Anybody, anybody remember the slush tick? <laughs> Fill the holes in your ice. This was a very cool product, a product on my part. There was a guy that always complained about there was no glide on his ice. So I got bottles, four ounce bottles, and I put 12 in a box, had labels made up with glide on it, filled them all up with water, and sent them off to him. <laughs> Told him to put them in his wash water. Make all the difference in the world. You'll have your glide back. He phoned and tried to order two more cases because it worked because <laughs> it worked so well. That can be a real dick sometimes. What's the, what's the subtractive that, is that, is that? No, that's gloss. That's yeah. something else. That's something else. This here is a rink that has an ice cube system in it, and they put the support beams underneath the header and they seem to be having a problem. Du, du, du. Skate around, get a drink, ride the carousel, have a couple beers. Ribbon rinks are coming. That's a great idea. Steampunk. <laughs> hey, yeah, get it all hooked up. Yeah, yeah, we'll go put some water out there. <laughs> Guy's got a two inch, got an inch, one inch hose wrapped in, right? And he's feeding it with a garden hose. Look at a bush down. I'm trying to figure out why there's no water pressure. <laughs> This is my hometown, town of Aurora. There was a crack between the board anchors in the concrete. The new lady in charge decided that she wanted to fill the crack up but didn't know what to do with it. So it was suggested to her that she drill a hole in the concrete where the crack is and then buy one of those spray cans of foam with the long tubes on the end and fill the crack up with foam. This is my hometown. Someone, someone got a drill out, someone got a drill out, drilled into the U-bend and covered the floor in glycol. Not glycol, so sorry, calcium chloride, brine. Came shooting out. They didn't know what to do. Shut off the plant, shut off the plant. They phoned Simcoe. Simcoe charged them $22,000 to drain the system, pop one panel of boards, take off the U-bend, put a new U-bend on, and then pack it with sand and shop back it, and they were in charge of cleaning up the ice. 
the calcium chloride was all over the floor, so they bought out a scrubber, took the scrubber, and did the whole floor with the scrubber. But what the problem was, the scrubbers pick up water and then go forward. Pick up water, go forward. But they were contaminating everything they were running into. So all of a sudden, they had this. I got some more pictures I can show you, but... Uh, and they, wouldn't, they couldn't get it to stick to the... It's salt. And they're trying to put their ice in. It's not sticking, and they want to know. So they finally break down and phone us, and they won't tell us the story. <laughs> like, wait, we're here to help you. <laughs> okay, you're stupid too. <laughs> but they wouldn't tell us the story, so I wouldn't help them. Found out later. Everybody wants these. Oh boy, hover lights on your skates. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I think the NHL, right? Uh, shit, I dig too far. All right, who did it? Who left the hose on the ice? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> a, it's Photoshop. Eh? We make fun of the guys. Polly and the guys. Polly and the guys in New York have got a very depraved sense of humor. So we took their. This is the end. The circus is no longer around. But they found they want Polly to take care of the elephants. <laughs> and this is something you should never do, even with an Olympia. You have runners. You know what the runners are for? Not for driving around on concrete. And the guy took his ice out that way. Oh, we had a small leak. The plant went down. We'll just restart it. This is from Salmon River, Nova Scotia. The rink is 150 by 75. And it's the first electric Zamboni. <laughs> he had a tractor. He bought a, had a, bought a used, the guy, I can't even think of his name now. One of the most ingenious guys I've ever met. He built it himself, had a tag along, couldn't run the diesel because it was a small rink and you, you're, you get carbon dioxide, you'll start poisoning people. So he built it from a forklift and a tractor. And it's, it's still working today. This is, this is the Rico Arena that we went to paint and we couldn't get anything to stick to the floor. They had cleaned their floor with dustbane. Dustbane is oil and sawdust. And this is us laying out that sheet that we uh, talked about. The reason we put the white down is because this floor was so dark. That's what it looked like. This is the lookup line in case anybody didn't see it. It was supposed to protect young children. Yeah, they do it in some U.S. cities. It's great. I sell five gallons of orange paint every time they put it in. But it doesn't do any good. The University of Calgary did a, did a report on it, and kids were, they were finding that kids were actually supposed to be safe in that zone. Kids were checking, looking down to see if they were in the safe zone while they were getting checked from behind. There it is right there. This is, yeah, this is my updated presentation. And it does. It, don't leave your stuff out there. Fill those cracks in, because ice expands at a rate of 9%. So every time you put water into a crack and it freezes, it gets bigger. So if you've got cracks in your floor, fill it with sand. At least the sand will displace the water. Playground sand. The old Halifax Forum. Still operating. 1907, something like 1920. Like they just keep referring, they, they should tear the building down. They're going to have another accident. There's your all-star game. That's the Brewster sprayer. And I don't know what's wrong with it. I've tried to fix that sprayer three times, change nozzles on it and everything else. And he says it's the lighting and he's got stripes down his ice. Don't know. Ooh, the new blue line. Everybody should have one. 
Isn't it All Star Games? Isn't it just that's about yeah, everything? Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. I don't know where this presentation was going. I was working on it a long time ago, but I think I was starting to drink towards the evening. <laughs> Cut the logo out. And that's what they did. And <laughs> I actually, yeah, I honestly don't know where it was, but they wanted to know how to fix it. They sent me the picture. <clears throat> yeah, it is Toronto, I think. They, wh they white out the old ones and put new ones over top. That's the NHL glass. Anybody deal with Athletic out here or uh, Cascadia? Cascadia boards? Athletica? Athletica boards and glass? Yeah, they're, they're a monster company now. They tried to buy us, the girl wouldn't sell. They bought Becker's, Cascadia, and Athletica are all now one company. And that's their NHL boards in Nassau Coliseum. The unfortunate part, after four games, the boards were starting to tip out. Dan went down to check those. That, that's the renovated Nassau? Yep, the renovated Nassau. There's one of the two nozzle sprayers. That would have been, I don't know where that is, Salt Lake, or that's Mark's building, I think, isn't it? That's Calgary, isn't it? Yeah. The full span. <laughs> what this guy did was he dropped dot, got Dayglow paint, which is the gold crease paint, and went out and splattered it on his ice and then put a black light on it. How much ice you got? There's a three inch puck, he's got four inches ice in the corners. How much does he normally carry? Had a busy day of edging, did you? What the hell is all oh. <laughs> that's, that's the Zamboni gate. It's V'd. And if you look at it, it's on a hoist on a track. I've wondered how many times you get your fingers pinched in that. Is that just one single chamber? Yep. There's no sense. Seneca College, uh, Finch and uh, 404, or Don Valley. It's been that way for years. Olympic Oval's got the race in. Mark put it in a couple of weeks ago. That's what I like about the Norwegians. They got good ideas. You just sort of drive the thing right off the ice. Just keep making more ice. Drop the gate down, away you go. Gonna clean some of these up. <laughs> what a mess that is. Why would you put curling on a hockey sheet? I don't know if I have enough pebbling heads. Oh, 
No, no, you need the ultra fine too. The fine, the 64, the 72. <sighs> It's all about the pebble. There he is there, the late Shorty Jenkins, the man who first textured rocks and started a whole new phenomenon in curling. <laughs> Fuck, this is, <laughs> we have fights with curling people. I'm just finishing off this presentation. We have fights with curling people all the time. And they were complaining the ice keeps picking. Whenever the water gets below, above five parts, when the ice is picking, the ice is picking. I said, okay, let's do a scrape, do a scrape. We scraped, <clears throat> and I sent this off to a lab, and the lab said, because I didn't know what it was. We did the scrape melts in the snow, and you couldn't see it. We sent it off to a lab, and this is like an 800 or 8,000 micro. I asked him what the white stuff was. He says, dead skin. <laughs> dandruff, and the blue stuff is fibers from a carpet. Fortran or something, that's what he gave the name to. That's why their ice is picking, because they got this stuff on it. Dead skin. It's those old people, I tell you. This is just before you lose it. That's just as the plant shut down and it's just starting to melt. <laughs> this is in Winnipeg. Pink glycol. You can get it clear. Why would you lose clear glycol? Because they want to find out where the leaks are. If you're going to have leaks, I don't want it. And that's that cobblestone ice we talked about. The sand floors, they didn't wet the sand out enough. So when they take the Zambonis out, the weight of the Zamboni crushes down the soft sand because it's not a block of ice anymore. Now the water's not too hard here. Pens to test. This is an RO system we put into the Mighty Ducks or the Anaheim Ducks practice rink. And this does about 2,500 gallons a day, which gives them enough for all their flooding for four pads of ice. And it all uses gray water, like off the showers, off the sinks. And the total price was $68,000. And then see the chains on the side of the drums? That's for earthquake protection. <laughs> I said, these things are 25,000 pounds. What the hell's gonna happen? They're gonna fall over? Gotta put them on. So what, what is, why would you, what is reverse osmosis? Reverse osmosis is a process of treating water to purify it. You push water under pressure into a membrane. Super yeah, about. 200 PSI, pressurize it. You got low pressure membranes coming out now, but they're not as good. And so the good water gets through the membrane and the bad water goes to drain. So to make a gallon of good water, you might push a gallon of water to drain. And that's what these membranes are in the thing. They're membranes and they're, there's a big pump inside of that and it pushes water. There's two carbon filters, two water softeners, and then they go through the membranes and then they go into that storage tank which supplies the four hockey rinks. This is a great little tool if you ever get a chance to buy one for ice makers. And I got them a Canadian tire for $249. It's an imager. And it's great if you want to find stuff on your floor, you want to find pipes. Uh, if you want to find uh, stuff coming through a doorway. And I, the first camera I bought was probably $2,800. And I use it just to find spots on pipe on a floor. You can find top dead center. When we were doing all the anchors for the NHL, when they changed 13 feet to 11 feet, it was really handy. And now they're making them just, must be making them in China or something. Give them a couple weeks, you buy the Dollarama. And this is the guy, 
that's absolutely courageous. He decided to take them off with his ice resurfacer. And it's, he smashed the front of his box. You could hear them hitting them. What are you doing? Wack, 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 wack. That's frost on a floor. Sometimes if you try to build that in and you don't burn it off, you'll get white, big white marks on your ice sheet down the road. This is a lithium bromide dehumidifier. They put it into LA. It cost over $380,000 and it still doesn't work. This is a flow control. Gives you how many gallons you want to fill up your Zamboni. You punch the numbers in and it will give you that gallonage every time. That's what it looks like it was installed. It's about $1,100. I like this one myself. It's about 120 bucks. <laughs> put it on a timer, you know you got 10 gallons a minute, it'll put 100 gallons in your machine and then shut it off. Now there's a professional. They're now putting shoes out and the new ones are the Vibram ones and they've got little pieces of steel in them and actually they do work. They're not slip, slippery. There's a company now testing them for postmen because you don't want your postman going down, do you? That means you'll be off for six months on compensation. So now they're putting, I think they're actually taking old steel belted tires, grinding them up and making soles for shoes out of them. My personal opinion because that's what it looks like. It's got that little steel chunk sticking out of it. And they do work. This is Staples Center. See the little boxes on the top over the, over the entrance to the building? They're gas generators. They have natural gas to the building and they generate power. So that at five o'clock, when your peak rate comes on, these come on at 549 generate power to the building so that they don't go into peak demand. Shut off at 9, start up in the morning at 6, and go to 10. They never hit peak. Black ice, and that's the lights on in the building. This is the Barclays Center. They're in New York, they, they load this building up. You pull into a, an elevator, your truck, your 45-foot tractor trailer, it takes you down to the lower level. You pull your truck onto this turntable and it turns your 45-foot tractor trailer to the loading dock, to the staging area. That's how expensive real estate is. Anyways, that's the end of that presentation. I'm still working on it. Can we do a water sample and you can show us what the Sure, on? sure. No, we're going to put the logo in tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, we'll be back in here. So, um, so this, like, this is um, Matthews, not you, from Canal Flats. I pulled it for everyone. They're not that interesting, but if everybody has one of these, I want them to be able to look at their report and know what what is important for them to focus on. I don't see anything yet. Hey, do you want my do you want my uh, HDMI cable? What the heck? 
F F five. Love the helmets. Hang on, go to that page. Okay. <clears throat> That's just definitions, right? Mm-hmm. Alkalinity, calcium, cardiac, the arteries coming in, it's not got, it's just given definitions, you're right. I know I have one for somebody. Yeah, maybe we'll do, um, do Summerlands. Oliver. Uh, arena. When do you got Arena Zones catalog for you? Say what? Arena Zones catalog. Got everything. <laughs> Quebec. It's Robert Boileau, the French guy. Yeah, good stuff in there. They've done a titrate test. Chlorides, fluorides, nitrates, nitrates, sulfates. These are anionic. Alkalinity, bicarbonate, conductivity. pH 7. is pretty neutral water. 6.5 to 8.5. Total is all solids. 373 ppm. That's that's fairly hard water. Two hundred, like this is this is the calcium hardness at three hundred, so the rest is probably showing up as a as a sodium. That's hard water. It's good for you. It's good where, for you. Where does your water come from? Like a well, like a deep well. Uh, yeah, some kind of aquifer that yeah. runs. So he have calcium. And more total dissolved solids since he's pulling from deeper in the ground. Well, no, it depends. It depends on what your water, water, water runs through the ground, and whatever it comes in contact with, water is a universal solvent. It's going to try and break it down. It'll eat up copper, it'll eat up metal it eventually. And if you take a look at where where I'm from, we have the Niagara Escarpment that runs Tobermory all the way up to Thunder Bay, out through Chicago and come. It's an old lake bed and it's dead crustaceans and uh, Blue Mountain is just like when they cut it off, it's blocks of limestone and that's calcium carbonate. And it's like you get up into that University of Guelph area, the water is hard. Like after about four weeks, at your, if you don't have a water softener, you're, you're with a pen, uh, with your pen trying to get your shower head cleaned out and your Zamboni holes, they stop by the Chinese food, food place and get those turkey, turkey uh, chicken skewers and they're out there with the wooden skewers trying to knock the calcium out of the, out of the, out of the spreader pipe. It's that hard. So is that, is that the only thing? The pH, now nah, we don't worry about pH is fine. TDS, total dissolved solids, 373, that's hard. But here's your calcium hardness. It's still 300. Seven, it's about 15, 17 grain. It should be treated. Total hardness as a calcium carbonate. There's a formula for it. I've got the thing on my computer, but I hate doing the math on it. That's the one, this is the one, this is, these are the two lines you're worried about. 
Saw total dissolved solids, 372. Actual hardness of water as a calcium carbonate is 306. This number will always be higher than this number because sodium isn't classified as a hardness. But if you have sodium in your water, that's why water softeners work off sodium, right? And there, it's a, it's a cation bed and you feed softened water through it, sodium, to regenerate it. And then what happens is all the mineral content that you push through it after that period of time gets attracted to the resin. And then eventually you've got to regenerate that resin again and trade it all for sodium ions. And then it comes through and it swaps it out. That's why you have softened water. They've taken the hardness out by exchanging it for sodium. Go up north? No? No? Yeah, it depends on where you are. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's, that's still classified as light water. When you get over that 300, I've got some places like 1200 ppm. And it's, it's hard. Holy doodle. Yeah. Carbonate. Not so bad. That's still, that's still up there though. You can see it ranging. They're doing tests on it. See it changing? We have this, we have this one in Woodstock, Ontario. They draw off three different wells. One of the wells is a swamp, right? So the water, you'll be there getting a glass of water, come back two hours later and you get the glass of water, you go, what the hell is this? And I always tell people, you look at your water, you look at it in a glass and you sometimes don't see it because it is a dissolved solid, total dissolved solid. And your water looks good and clear, but I've got, we're, we're in Newmarket, Ontario, and we, I'm, we fill up a 100 gallon, you fill up a glass, it looks fine. You fill up a 100 gallon barrel, you throw a penny in the barrel, you can't see the penny at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, and you can, you, you can taste the hardness in the water. Water really doesn't have any taste, or shouldn't have any taste. What you usually get is chlorine. Doesn't have any taste. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. It's flat. Yeah. But if you got mineral water, yeah, it'll have taste. What do we got here? Spring water. It'll have a number on here. They have to, by law, put it on. Prepared by. Ooh, look at this. Overweight Food Corporation. What do you got on it? I got 30 milligrams of calcium. Nothing. Hey, it's got no fat in it. <laughs> hmm? TDS. That's nothing. That's nothing. pH 7, that's absolutely neutral. Total alkalinity, calcium carbonate, nothing. Like, that's. That's high quality water. You really don't need you. What? Oh. But you usually don't see stuff like that number. That's less than a grain of hardness. 17 parts per million. Yeah. But that's but the problem is the people that put calcium chloride into your into your into your brine lines are supposed to use DI or RO water for the mix. They're not supposed to take tap water and mix it with the calcium chloride because they're mixing iron, calcium, magnesium in with sodium chloride. They don't Simcoe rents tanks off off us all the time when they go to do a new install because they want zero water to mix their brine with. You don't want a, a hard water. And most towns give you this water, this water report. By law, I think they have to. 
But we're finding more and more prairie towns are going to water treatment, purified water, especially out in the prairies, because the water out there is horrible. Yeah, yeah. Shoal Lake. Brandon, oh. Do you notice everybody out here came from out east? Yeah, and they don't go back, do they? Just to visit, just to. Yeah, that's pretty good. Total dissolved solids, 5130, that's, that's relatively light water. Where is this? Yeah. Lumbi. Is that named after some Swedish country or something like that? Lumbi? Lumbi? Lumbi. That's, I think. A There's some action here. Look, it hardly has any cyanide in it at all. <laughs> Total hardness of the calcium carbonate, that's hard water. No question about it. I don't see, what I don't see though is, that's the end of the list. There should be A, B, C, D, uh, keep going, yeah, yeah, okay, it's not the end of the list. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, there's, got some magnesium, it's not bad. Magnesium, Hard, hardly any iron at all in it. Iron shows up usually as an orangish color water when it's, but now they're using sodium silicate to sequester iron at the, at the water treatment plants. Yeah, you're, you're good. I, don't, I still don't see where there's any sodium in there. Yep, sodium, 17 ppm. That's not a lot, that's a grain of sodium. But I have seen, there's one thing you look for in water. If you got high salt contents, we had one in Moose Factory where the guy was drawing water in and it was almost like seawater at a well and the seawater was leaching into as well. Well, seawater is 3% sodium. 1% sodium will retard your freezing rate by two degrees. So he'd be all of a sudden run his plant colder to make ice. And the sodium would leach out and he'd go out and scrape his ice and oh, everything's fine. Slowly but surely more sodium would come up to the surface and his ice would go soft on him. <laughs>